You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. I'm going solo gay to, uh, I'm going solo again today. And I have the fortune of having Nolan Miner on. He just got back from the Santi Cooper event, the Hobie BOS uh, event there. Um, and it was he had a really good finish, finishing in the top 10. And so I just want to pick his brain and kind of do a recap on what he had to do to prepare for the event, his practice, and the event itself. Nolan, how are you doing today? I'm doing all right. Yeah, thanks again for kind of uh, meeting meeting with me on such short notice. Um, I guess let's just kind of get in, into it. How, how many days did you get to practice down there? And is this your first time at Sandy Cooper? It was my first time at Santee Cooper. I'm trying to think back. So I think I went on, my plan was to fish on, uh, on Wednesday, which was, uh, the tournament started on Saturday. So I wanted to start practicing on, on Wednesday and my game plan since I think it's only, I say only cause I traveled to a lot of tournaments, but it was only six and a half hours from my house, which <laughs> felt pretty short. Um, so I was going to get up really early and drive down and then start kind of mid morning or late morning, um, practicing because in springtime, usually you want to fish, you know, in the afternoon, um, that's when the fishing gets better. Sometimes your morning, you're just really waiting, mm. uh, for the fishing to get right. But then, uh, I checked the forecast for down there and it was supposed to start thunderstorming at like one o'clock. So then on Tuesday night. I just started driving because I needed to be there at daylight the next morning to get some practice time in because it's really important to get, I I think, um, as many days as you can uh, practicing because in a kayak, you just can't move around that much. You know, Um, you can move to different boat ramps, but even then you're not covering a ton of water once you do put in at these different boat ramps. Uh, So it just takes more time, I think. And I, I've always felt that the three days because the elite series has three days of official practice. And I've always felt like I would target three days, maybe a fourth if it's a huge fishery or to give myself an extra day in case we have a bad weather event during practice that kind of, you know, you lose a day. But yeah, so I, I ended up driving down there and I slept at a truck stop. There's a truck stop right uh, beside Santee Cooper. And I stayed there, got up in the morning and went and started my practice. Um, and yeah, that's, that's, um, <laughs> it was pretty, pretty hectic. That stuff. is pretty I gnarly. Knew that, that's what I had to do in order to get some time, you know, cause I knew I wasn't going to get a full day, uh, on that first day because of the storms coming in. Good God. I mean, just going through the night like that, that's where Red Bull and Adderall comes in. So do, do, do you like travel alone or do you have uh, a group that you go to with these tournaments to bounce ideas off of? So my little brother, Ewing, who fished um, last year in the Hobie BOS, was his first year, and he has had great success there. I travel, well, I mean, I, I don't travel with him, but once I get to the events, you know, we all are coming from different places, but mm-hmm. there's there's a, a group that he usually stays with. You know, the group kind of changes, but usually there's eight or ten guys who get a house um, that we will all stay with. And so there's a couple of guys at the house that I know who I'll, bounce ideas off of and Ewing and I, my younger brother and I, we constantly talk calling each other throughout practice. Um, you know, we're talking before what we're thinking about, what's going to be happening before the event, what our game plans are. And then there's a couple people that we don't stay with who I've just met through fishing the tournaments who I'll also, you know, share information. And it's kind of, you got to figure out who you're talking to. You mm-hmm. know, it's, it's not something you can just jump into sharing information with everybody, but if you find the right people, um, who, you know, it's a mutually benefiting relationship when you share that information, you, that that's what you just have to watch out for because some people are only looking to get information and they don't mm. want to share with you. No, it's nice. Like, uh, fishing with my brother during college and stuff, it is nice to have somebody you can trust with information. Um, but with, with a boat though, it's so much easier to go through water with, with a kayak. Are, are you looking for people that are in different areas than you to share information with you have a strategy on how to break down water in a kayak? Because like you said, like it's a lot harder to cover water. Right. So the cool thing is, um, 
with having all these, you know, I mean, I don't have a ton of connections, but I have a handful of people that I'll share information with. So we'll all talk about, you know, Santee Cooper. First of all, there's two different lakes you can fish. And then in within those lakes, there's regions that are completely different from one another. So we would all kind of talk like, hey, I spent one day on this part of Lake Marion. This is what it was like. You know, have you experienced anything similar where you've been in XYZ part of the lake? Uh, and my brother and I, we usually will have, you know, a set group of areas that we want to make sure we kind of check off practicing and scouting these places. And so it'll be like our discussion prior to a practice, day would be, hey, I'm going to go to the north side. And then, you know, you go check this big creek on the east side that we also talked about. And then we'll both decide what we think about these areas. And if somebody finds something good enough that they feel like it would be enough for two fishermen because first of all, in a kayak tournament, you're going to have a bunch of people fishing anyway. So like if I find a great spot, I might say, Hey, you know, you and you can probably fish something close by and it'll be the same. You know, there's, Mm -hmm. there's some similar water over here that you should check out. Uh, because I'm not really protective about something that I myself find in practice because in tournaments, we're all good fishermen. The fish are going to get found. So sharing it with somebody who I know who's going to work with me, I would rather do that than, you know, show up. There's going to be other people fishing it anyway. Um, mm. So it, yeah, that's, that's kind of how that works. It's a very dynamic situation trying to, you know, practice and network with everybody, but it works out. And, and specifically in a tournament at this time of year, where I'm assuming they're kind of in that late spawn stage, uh, at this point with, with some waves coming up, like were, were you, were sight fish actually playing into it at all? Were, were you bending hooks? I mean, what, what was your, what were your thoughts going into practice versus like getting into the tournament? Yeah. So my brother and I, um, we, you know, I, I keep talking about him cause like practice really, he was a huge part of it cause him and I are constantly discussing, but we, uh, it, my thing with practicing and shaking fish off versus catching them is usually if I'm in a new area, I'm pretty much always going to set the hook because I need to know what I'm working with. You know, I could shake off a bunch of fish and then it turns out they're all 14 inches, which at Santee Cooper would not have been great. Mm-hmm. Um, so I usually, what I do is I will set the hook until I've caught one or two of those quality fish that I'm, you know, knowing that that's what I want to see for the tournament. Then I may, usually I don't even start shaking fish off. A lot of times I'll just, I'll see water that is the same as what I've just had those bites in and go, all right, I'm not even going to mess with that. I'll just explore that during the tournament, especially in a kayak because you're not able to move as much. So it's like, I'm just going to leave that and fish it with a completely open mind in the tournament. I prefer that to actually shaking off a fish mm-hmm. and then trying to go back and catch or, you know, cause you kind of have an idea like, Oh, he was on that stump. Whereas, if I just see seven pretty stumps down a bank, I'm like, all right, I'm not even going to touch those that way in the tournament. I'm going to fish each one. Like I think there's a fish there instead of, you know, having this idea of like, maybe those two were the best or something. Mm -hmm. No, Um, yeah, but yeah, we were, I think they were spawning um, a lot on those cypress trees. Bass love to spawn on cypress trees. It's something they do a lot in Virginia. I touched on that in the video. I've done that a lot um, on, I've done it on the Chickahominy River some, and uh, the James River has cypress trees. I've fished for them there as well. And then there's a lake called Dyeshun Reservoir. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's uh, down there near the Chickahominy River, and it it's actually, well, there's a creek on the Chickahominy River that Dyeshun Reservoir flows into, and it's one of the biggest creeks on the Chick River (laughs) that everybody fishes, Dyeshun Creek. But that lake has cypress, and I fish there a lot, and that is really where because Ewing and I years ago um, fished a kayak tournament out there and the exact same thing that we experienced at Santee Cooper was occurring on that lake. It was funny because our first day of practice, we were like, this is <laughs> this is the same as that time on Dyson because the fish were spawning on the cypress trees and the way you had to fish for them was extremely similar. So it almost felt like we were on the same lake, even though we were you know, in South Carolina. That's that's pretty cool. Um and again, watching your video, guys, and again, all of his information will be linked in the video description. Go watch the video. Uh, we are going to do a little bit of a, a breakdown of, of kind of what he was dealing with there. And to me, it's just that is insane. The amount of cypress trees you're dealing with and, and 
how the hell do you have it waypointed from practice or how the hell do you figure out which cypress trees are the juice unless you're in i guess one strategy is you fish every damn tree but is there a, a way to figure out the high percentage areas for people that don't fish cypress trees All right so usually um with those cypress trees in the springtime and i think probably all the time but i mostly have experience fishing them in the springtime isolated trees are the best so this one obviously right here in front of me in this video where i caught my first fish of the day there's all those trees right there but this is an isolated tree it's you know kind of out away from the others it's large and usually it'd be like fishing anything if there's you know seven bushes on a bank and you're going to fish all seven bushes and one of them is more dense or maybe it has a log jammed in it or something it's going to be a little better a little more appealing to those fish cypress trees are the same way if it's a little bigger maybe it's older has more roots um that's kind of how you have to, and you know isolated is always is always good for cypress trees but the problem is in the springtime they are spawning and so a spawning fish is not going to be as selective about being on an isolated place because he's not worried about feeding and i feel like that's why isolated places are good because you know the bait fish are probably more likely to be ambushable from there because if they come by you know there's nothing else around for them to hide in but anyway a spawning fish a lot of them would just be random among those trees and you would just have to really be methodical and thorough in fishing them especially with how many fishermen were around i talked about that in the video i knew that yeah i could probably pick the isolated trees and those would be the highest percentage ones but there's so many people fishing that other fishermen are going to hit these high percentage places so i need to be thorough and pick up the ones that have been overlooked which are going to be in those less obvious places like this stretch in front of me that you just paused on there's a ton of targets right there so five people could fish that before me and not make the cast that i end up making if i'm thorough enough yeah one of my notes from watching the video you kept talking about was was casting angles and, and making the right presentation like how how many casts are you making into a spot before you move on? Is this repetitive cast or is this one and done? Or is it based on practice knowing that this is the juice and I need to spend more time on it? Yeah, this is so springtime is a lot different when you think you're dealing with spawning fish that you can't see, which is, you know, that's what I was assuming was probably occurring here. You treat it a little differently uh, because, I mean, you know, if you imagine when you're fishing for a bed fish, if you know it's sometimes they're very aggressive and they'll bite right away and i think those are probably the ones that we're catching on these trees but if it's an aggressive bed fish that'll bite right away and you miss his bed by six inches he's not even going to pay attention to your bait and so that's why i feel like making so many casts on all the potential places so like ewing was telling me in practice that he felt he was getting bites usually on the sides of the cypress trees instead mm. of on the front um, and so, you know, pretty much I would cast as I'm approaching the tree, I'm going to hit the side facing me. Then I'll hit the front side that's facing out towards the Creek, then the, uh, far side. And then the back side. I would make, you know, two to four flips, depending on how big the tree was. And if I felt like, if I felt like there was a possibility of a bass to be on that tree and not see my bait fall, I would make another cast so that if there was one there, you know, if he was on that part of the tree that he would see the bait and, I don't normally fish that way. I normally am pretty fast uh, and like to fish high percentage stuff and, you know, move through it pretty quickly. Cause usually in my opinion, if a bass is there and he wants to bite, he's going to, but when the spawn is happening, it's totally different. And especially, you know, in a kayak, I'm having to kind of change the way that I fish because I can't just move around as much as I could in a bass boat. Yeah. I was going to say like, that is insanely methodical to do, you know, th what, three or four angles on one tree and then move on. Mm -hmm. So like, I mean, how much, how much ground were you actually covering? I mean, even in a kayak, you can cover a little bit more ground or are you going back and forth in the same areas? Like what was yeah, that? Strategy? So this Creek, I think it had a lot more potential than it actually ended up showing. And I didn't even realize that, um, uh, from practice I fished it. Cause when I fish in practice, like I was telling you, I'm not trying to shake off a bunch of fish and be like, oh, you know, I had, I had 15 bites in there. When I fished this uh, area in practice, I caught five fish total because I was fishing pretty fast. Cause in my opinion, if there's enough fish there for me to fish it during the tournament, I can be buzzing through stuff and cast here and there. And if I get a few bites, that means, okay, if I go back and I'm thorough, I should have a really good day. Mm -hmm. And that was what it made me feel like. Um, fishing this creek but it was 
I want to say the creek was maybe two miles long, but oh, wow. the um that was on the north side of Lake Marion. And so you had main lake water that was extremely muddy, like blowout. You're not catching fish in this water muddy. You know, it's I love muddy water, but it was too muddy. And the fish and especially in the springtime, I don't think they really like that water moving and they want something stable um and so these creeks had kind of that tannic swamp water like southeastern virginia has um and you know i don't know if that's the cypress trees that make it that way but you've seen that you know kind of tea colored water and that was what we were trying to target and so when you went halfway back into this creek that was where it transitioned from that main lake mud to this more stable you know in my opinion better water for them to want to spawn in and so not only was I targeting that back half of the creek, but so were all the 13 other kayak fishermen who started in the creek with me. So that is why I had to be as thorough and as slow and fish through stuff multiple times. You know, it's not something I would ever do when I'm fun fishing, but there's things you have to do in a tournament that you just got to put your head down. And, you know, because when there's a bunch of people fishing in an area and it's a good area, usually somebody's going to have to be the guy to catch them. That's the way I always look at it. Like, yeah, that community hole gets crushed, but somebody's going to catch fish there because they're community holes for a reason. You know, there's a lot of fish there. You just have to be confident in that, you know, if I do my job and outfish everybody here, I'll have a successful outcome. Oh, clearly you did with this absolute schlaunch that you just, you, you stuck. That, that was a big one. Yeah, that was exciting. <laughs> I I mean, so a, a couple of things that I, I do want to, I do want to get to this fish catch when you're kayak fishing comparatively you, it seems like you're going to deal with more pressure especially in areas how do you mentally block that out compared to maybe if you're in a boat hey i'm going to run to this remote area knowing that if it doesn't pan out i can blast back a and you're right like those community holes have ha are community hole for a reason they have fish like how do you mentally block it out do you just try to do something a little bit different than everyone else or just try to outfish people doing the same thing as everybody else a little bit of both. I mean, I feel like I have, you know, pretty good ability. My little brother and I always kind of feel the same way about that when we're somewhere we've just spent so much time fishing that um, I try to, you know, whether it's right or not, I try to think when I see somebody out there, I'm like, well, I, I can outfish that guy. You know, I'm not. And that, that's really how you have to think about it because you don't want to be out there thinking like, wow, that guy's really good. He's, you know, he's probably catching a lot of fish in here. Um, and I, I'm not familiar enough with the kayak anglers yet to know when I see somebody, if that's somebody that I don't want to be sharing water with. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so, yeah, and I, fishing this way, I felt more confident than usual about fishing around everybody because of how the, like I explained, you had to make a lot of presentations and I was fishing a very lightweight Texas rig or lightweight for what I usually use. I was only using a quarter ounce weight. So it was a pretty slow fall. And I feel like most people, most people that I saw were fishing moving baits. They were throwing spinner baits and chatter baits. And in practice, I really never caught anything on. I actually, I don't think I caught a single fish on a moving bait. At wow. Santee Cooper in our entire time there. And I don't think my brother did either. He caught, well, no, he caught two at a culvert pipe that was like churning water out, but that's, you know, we, kn we knew that that didn't, apply to the rest of what we were doing and so that really told me since we weren't getting any fish on moving baits that they're they're spawning or they're close to spawning because when they're very close to spawning they don't want to chase they want something a texas rig a wacky rig a drop shot you know slower moving baits uh and it was it was weird because we had changing conditions and uh, you know, the water was dropping. We had some cold front stuff happening. We weren't on a full moon. We were maybe the moon was, I guess it was going away. It was waning and it was maybe half or less. And the full moon is what those fish kind of, that's what people talk about waves. The full moon is usually what triggers those waves. The elite series had just been there and they were very close to a full moon. So I think they had a big push of fish. But when we were there, yes, they're spawning because it's that time of year. They're, you're going to have spawning fish. But I don't think we had a big wave. But I think they were around and ready and kind of in that mood. So it, you had to fish for them, assuming that that was the phase that they were in. They weren't necessarily spawning, but if they weren't on a bed, they were close to it. And they were kind of in that weird stage where they're not worried about feeding as much. So you have to kind of fish that way, knowing that. How do you deal 
with it when it comes to sight or not sight fishing, but spawn fishing without sight fishing, uh, is, is there adjustments that you make in your tackle or is it what, what kind of tips and tricks can you give people listening to this about that? Because I, I know on the, on the title of Potomac, you can deal with that a lot where you're not actually visually watching these fish hit it. Um, so, I mean, what, what do you do with your tackle setup to make sure you can maximize success? So, like I said, I was fishing that lighter weight. Um, and a lot of the times I'll throw a, a wacky rig. I mean, it, I've always said in April and May, regardless of how you feel about a wacky rig, if you're not throwing it, you're making a mistake most of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, Cause it's a bait that you can throw it and you, that you got a great chance at getting bites from any size of fish, but also it is a bait that very large fish, they can't tell that it's not real. In my opinion, you know, there's a few baits mm -hmm. like a frog, for instance, it's silent. They can't tell. It doesn't have rattles, you know, so frogs, you're right. Everybody frogs get big bites, no matter where you throw them. Like in general, that's a great way to get a big bite. A wacky rig in the springtime is the same way. If you watch tournaments, there's a lot of tournaments where some guys just going down the bank with a wacky rig in the springtime, all of a sudden he catches a fish. that's a seven pounder. So that is one of the baits that when you know that they're spawning and you can't see them, it's, it's good because you just, you have a great chance at getting a, a a big bite and in this case you know i caught that big one on the texas rig but um it, why, why, why texas it, rig versus like a jig or, or a drop shot or something like that that you yeah so i i don't really like jigs when the fish are around the spawn like if i'm fishing for huh. fish that i don't think um i can you know i can't see fish on beds but i think some are probably on beds that i'm fishing for i don't really like a jig i don't really have a reason for that um i feel like a texas rig i mean well no here, here's my reason so with a jig i feel like if he nips at it he's a jig doesn't feel the same as a texas rig so like if he gets it halfway because in the spawn they'll do that a lot you know they'll kind of half-heartedly bite the thing and i feel like with a jig he's a lot more likely to reject it spit it back out when they're eating a jig you know they're gonna thump like you feel that thump and he's got it but these fish you wouldn't even feel them pick it up when they would eat our baits. Um, I was using that little uh, brush hog, little baby brush hog. My little brother was using a Senko uh, Texas rig with an eight ounce weight for a really slow fall. But we were both doing the same thing. Those were just the baits that we had confidence in. But we both talked through practice and in the tournament. When you would get a bite, you'd pitch it up there on that cypress tree. And usually you would not feel the fish pick it up. You'd just be working it. And then all of a sudden it's kind of mushy feeling and, and then it's just swimming off which is to me, that's a fish that's all he's doing is picking it up out of his bed to carry it away. Cause you never felt the thump. They would, you know, it was very, very light bites. That's why you saw with all the fish that I caught, I think in the video, I kind of like check up on them when I get bit. Mm -hmm. Normally you don't, it's not like that. You kind of know when they, when they pick it up, especially when you're that close to the fish, I was very close to them when I would get bit. So usually you can tell, but they were just biting so light, which reinforced that idea that they're probably spawning. Now with this launch that you caught, did, was it like a repetitive cast? Like it, it, it bit once and you'd cast back in there. Is it first try? That was, that them? was my first cast right there. And she got it, you know, on the drop where she picked it up after it hit the bottom. I don't know with those really big ones. I don't know that that's a fish that you're necessarily going to catch fishing blind in the bed, just because whenever you see paired up fish on a bed and there's a big one there, it's on, she, like, she never bites first cast i i don't think anyway the a big male will but a fish of that caliber that's a female and i think probably she had just gotten done or maybe she had a little bit of spawning left to do i mean she, it wasn't a, a skinny completely post spawn fish but that mm -hmm. fish had definitely sp spawned at least you know once but they'll spawn multiple times so it's not like they just go up spawn one time and they're done um and so i think that fish was you know in between or had gotten finished up or whatever and that's when that fish is catchable because it you know it's done spawning now it wants to eat a little bit uh but yeah that was i caught her on the first first pitch into that spot but even that fish you'll see i pitch in there and i'm like messing around doing other you know i think i was adjusting the boat maybe and then i pick back up and she's got it and i never i would have felt her hit it on the drop if she really you know ate it like and especially a big fish like that like they you know when they flare their gills you can feel that it's a sharp tap at least mm -hmm. and I, I never felt anything and the cool thing about a kayak fishing like this i can force myself to slow down because you got to make so many little adjustments and that hobie 360 drive is amazing for 
all these little movements I got to make to kind of, you know, position myself around these trees. But I, I could pitch in there and make myself slow down once the bait hit the water. So I'd pitch in there and then maybe readjust my kayak, pick up, work it a little bit, you know, and I, I don't like fishing slow. And so I have to find creative ways to, to make myself do that. And that was, that was one of the ways I would do it. Now, do you stand up to make your pitches or are you doing that all sitting down? I was sitting down pretty much the whole time just because, uh, I mean, it, it didn't serve much of an advantage for me to stand up and I would be standing up, sitting back down, standing up, sitting mm -hmm. back down. And I saw so I would be less efficient that way. And it's not like I could see where I was trying to cast to. If the water was clear and I felt like I was maybe looking for a bed to pitch into, like I could see a light spot, I would stand up some. When I would actually go and look for sight fish um, at this tournament, I would stand up. But when I was just fishing, no, I was I pretty much stay sitting down. My little brother is that way, too. He said he pretty much always fish is sitting down aside from i think when he throws a glide bait and he wants to be able to see if a fish follows it so he can try to make that fish bite but out of all the kayak fishing he does he pretty much stays sitting and it's so, less fun like i like to be able to stand up so it's yeah. very visually engaging you see some of the bites happen but as far as trying to be efficient when you're fishing in a tournament probably just stay sitting down is what i do it seems like it'd just be so frustrating to deal with casting and stuff when you constantly sit it's like i mean so like flipping I, I i'm assuming are you using like a flipping rod setup is it the same thing you use out of a boat or do you go with a shorter rod combo when you're in a kayak like i, I always have used the same the exact same rods as i use in a boat uh i'm pretty tall you know i'm six two so it's taller fishermen we always have an easier time using those longer rods i have some friends that fish that are um you know five seven five eight and they definitely they have to it seems like they have to cater their rods more the rod lengths more to their you know fishing presentations um i think i was using a seven two medium heavy in this video because I, I was only fishing 15 pound line because again it's spawn i'm trying Damn. to be i mean they weren't they weren't really in the stuff like when you would hook one there was nothing for him to get you and he was on the edge of that tree and i never had a single fish have me around anything uh that i caught if i was worried about that i would have used bigger line but and I, I also felt like you know again i'm fishing around so many people it is it's not clear water but in that tea colored water they can still see you know it's not like dirt so i, I felt like that that lighter line probably helped me uh more so with the presentation the bait behaves a little more naturally without having that big weight when you're using you know a light Quarter, I was using a quarter ounce weight. I call it light. So that's not light to some people, but to me, it's light. Uh, 20 pound line, it's not going to behave the same when you're fishing it. On 15, it's, you know, that thing is moving a lot more and it's that line is not going to affect it as much. The same, same concept, I think, with a drop shot. Like when you use six pound line versus eight, I don't think it's the fish not being able to see it. It's the way your bait behaves due to mm -hmm. the line diameter. There's a, that people don't talk about that very much. I think that's a big big thing that people overlook and that's so that's why i was fishing 15 in this situation and i was using a i changed my hook for when i'm using lighter line so normally i'll use if i'm using 20 fishing around stuff like this i'll use a straight shank three out hook but i was using i think it's just called an offset worm hook it's not a wide gap but it's got that little you know spot for you to texas rig it um and i was using a three out you know it's not a super line hook or anything and i'm not hitting the fish terribly hard but that's you know when i'm fishing lighter line i don't think i can set it hard enough for a straight shank so i change my hook too and that's that's why i was using i mean you can see the hook in the video if you watch it but nobody talks about that enough uh, we did a we did a live stream a week ago just about bank fishing and the importance of the pressure that you're dealing with and going down in line size and you see that in california and japan where people are fishing like with three and four pound tests because you will get more bites and it's such a weird taboo thing virginia and down south where if you're not fishing with like 15 plus and a, mm -hmm. and a, and a broomstick no one's going to do it but it's like that's the future i think with more and more pressure on fisheries you've got to be comfortable with downsizing your line um, cause you'll get bit more. I hundred percent, I hundred percent believe it myself. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Now. So just to kind of walk through the rest of this tournament with us. So you had two and that big ass launch. I mean, did you feel like going at, like at that point that you were set? Like, where oh, was your I, mindset? Right. I was, I was so confident because <laughs> I went to this Creek thinking 
because really in practice, we were catching big fish. Like the average size was so good all through practice. If I got a bite, it was at least 17 inches. Like most of the time when I set the hook, it was 17, 18, 19 inches. And the first day of practice, I caught one that was, I think, 22 and a half inches. The second day of practice, I caught one that was 23 <laughs> inches. And so I was like, you know, and, and both of them were doing different stuff, but I caught them both on that baby brush hog, you know, just fishing around uh, in the areas near where there were males spawning. You know, they weren't, neither of them, I never visibly sight fished them, but both of them were caught, you know, just fishing around how, the same way I caught the big one on tournament day. And I was like, if I can get one or two bites like that in the tournament, I'll be set. That's all I need. And th I figured the rest of my fish, if I just got five, you know, or four other bites, they'd probably be pretty nice. And I told you we had dropping water. So you can even see it. I, I totally like, didn't pick up on it at all. Look at these cypress. Yep. You can see the water has fallen. I, when I put in, I like didn't even pay it any mind. Maybe I thought like boat wakes had made it or that maybe that's just something I wasn't thinking about. I mean, really seeing that it dropped once i'm there it's not going to change my day right i'm probably i'm not going to go change and go somewhere else this is all i had we had wind this day so i was going to bunker down in this spot and this is what i was doing i had to make it work you know if the fishing got weird i had to figure out how i needed to adjust to catch those fish but you can see the water has fallen and that's what made the bite get tough like this tournament had it stayed, the had the water remained stable the way it was in practice, it would have been way better than it was. Like, I would have, with what I caught, had it been the way it was in practice, I think I maybe would have been, like, between 20 and 15th place. That's how good it was. It was insane. My little brother and I, we were worried. We were like, I think you're going to need 95 inches a day to be in, the, you know, top 15, top 10, at least. We figured whoever won would easily have over 100 a day. Easily. Damn. because of how good practice was and that water they don't like especially in the springtime when they're trying to spawn they do not like dropping water so so then is that something that you noticed or looking back that that was happening in practice or was this literally overnight you know it dropped like that because that's a substantial pull down it happened water. it happened overnight oh, it man. happened overnight that seems a lot like kerr reservoir actually in the springtime well it's <laughs> It's so weird because it's not dam controlled. Lake Marion <laughs> is not controlled by a dam. It has that canal at the bottom end of it that connects the two lakes. And so the water coming in from the river at the top of Marion flows in. It has the ability to flow in far faster than it can leave the lake. Hmm. So it was, you know, because that river coming in, I guess it's the Congaree maybe. I could be wrong on that, but I think that's the river that feeds it. Um, when it leaves Lake Marion and flows into Moultrie through that canal, it can only go so fast. So you have all this water coming in. You know, it's like if you if there was a uh, you had a water bottle and you punched a hole in it and then you used a faucet to fill it up. That's kind of what happens. And so this water is leaving the lake in the canal slowly. And I guess at some point that water slows down coming from the Congaree. Like I'm sure there's a way to calculate it, looking at gauges and stuff. But I totally, you know. It, it would take time. You'd have to live around there or fish there a lot to understand it. And so I think eventually what happened was during, probably during our practice, that water from the river that had come from a rain a few days prior had slowed down and become more normal. And then um, it starts to leave through that canal. And so now you're getting less water from that river and it's leaving through the canal. So now the lake starts dropping at some point it's going to switch, right? The river is not flowing as hard anymore and it's able to leave the canal. So that's why that water started dropping. And when it started dropping, it went fast, very fast. Got it. So it was more of like the rain that you had created like a bottleneck where it was just a little bit higher and it had to wait for the, the regular flow to come back. Exactly. And, but what that does mean is that Lake Moultrie, it is controlled by a dam. So when that water was leaving, <laughs> Lake Marion is dropping, Lake Moultrie is coming up slowly and was staying stable. But the wind prevented me from fishing Moultrie on the first day. But in my opinion, that was probably your better stable water. It's not where the tournament was won, but in my opinion, that's where you'd find your better fishing is in the springtime. You want that stable water. So that's why I changed went to Moultrie day too. It really made the decision easy because the water was falling up there in Marion where I fished the first day. Um, bite was getting bad. I fished the area very hard and I was like, cool, I don't even have to think about wanting to fish this lake. I can go fish those other fish I found and, and knowing that the conditions are better there than they are on the other lake.
So then, I mean, finishing up day one, you were in the top 10 right after day one, correct? And then that's what really made your decision to kind of switch lakes? Because that would, to me, would be mentally, if I know I'm in the top 10 where I'm at, that would be hard for me to be like, ah, I want to bug out and try somewhere completely different. Yeah. I mean, I, I felt, aside from that one big one, I mean, I had a pretty challenging day. And I felt very fortunate to have gotten the bites that I got. You know, I made it work, but I didn't catch a ton of fish. Um, it felt like the bite got worse and worse as the day went on. And the water was still dropping. I think it dropped. I, I could be wrong on this. This was just what somebody said to me at the meeting. I haven't actually looked back to look at the gauges and see how much it actually dropped. I think it dropped several inches overnight between the last day of practice and the first day of the tournament. And then during the tournament, it was obviously falling. And then I think overnight it dropped another six inches and even more so on day two of the tournament kept falling. I mean, I was talking wow. to guys and they said the water was, it was like the bottom dropped out of the lake. I could be wrong in saying that, but that's, that's what I was told. No, that's damn. Yeah. That's you got to leave there. And this is yep. a place that you actually had, you've actually did scout out a little bit in pre-practice, like you said. Yeah. It's where I started. My first day of practice was on uh, Lake Moultrie and I, that's where I caught a 22 something the first day. And I caught, I caught a, a male that was like 19 and a quarter. Uh, and it, since it was so far away, I figured, it, you know, I could catch that male. And there's a good chance by the tournament, by the time tournament rolls around, he may be tough to catch, but I thought I could maybe catch him again. But I also knew there's other fishermen, right? This is Santee Cooper in the spring. He's going to get caught. I might as well caught, catch him and see how big he is. Uh, and spawn fish are very, when you find one like three, four days out from the tournament, you know, there's a good chance he's just done by the time you actually go and try to fish for him. But yeah, I caught, I saw a lot of fish too on that first day that were kind of just skirting around, you know, nervous, like looking for beds up in the shallow water, but not, not catchable. And I was hoping some more of those fish had locked down. And I found an area that I felt like I caught some fish on a spot where I was just dragging a Texas rig on the bottom. And it was the first place that they would have to stop on their way into spawn or the place that they would end up on their way out from spawning and i i thought i was going to be able to catch some fish there and i caught two but they were freaking 12 inches on, <laughs> on the first day of the tournament so then I, I really had to start scrambling but i knew that there was enough there from what i had observed that if you know i put my head down and fished i could probably make it work and i did so you're you're in the top 10 you got today you got to day two um i mean kind of you want to walk us through kind of that yeah before i do uh i'm using my phone and evidently live stream really sucks the battery down so i'm gonna go grab a charger and i'll be right back that's no problem no guys it's really nice to to have uh nolan on last minute like this um to really talk about you know kind of his success and also just kind of the the mental way uh, of fishing these tournaments because people don't people don't really understand that like the mental side of it uh, fishing mentally these types of tournaments and the decisions that go into it and everyone wants to know about the baits and, and wants to know about you know what line they use things like that but people don't really want to actually talk about the how um mentally how you make those decisions and that to me is what's so so important about tournament fishing is not what lure they use because every every podcast every show is what lure it's about those mental changes those adjustments because you're an athlete and if you've been a quarterback or a baseball player soccer whatever it's about those decisions you make in the last two minutes and how you pivot and you know just talking to to, to nolan here his ability to make that pivot and to be like you know what i'm gonna scrap this i'm gonna go to somewhere else like those are the decisions that they cash your checks and win it's not just the debate. It's about those decisions you make in the heat of the moment. And those are just so vital and important compared to getting your ass kicked and cashing a check. So let's see. Nolan should be back. Yep. Sweet. Yeah. Uh, let's get back to it here. But uh, yeah, uh, I was just kind of ranting a little bit, just the importance of the decision making. And people don't really, I think, talk about that enough when it comes to, um, you know, fishing and the importance of making those decisions on the water and how those voices in your head can get really crazy, uh, especially, you know, when you have a good successful day, uh, what you're going to do the next day and scrap it and go to something else. That takes a lot of balls to do because a lot of people don't do that. They're, they're afraid to make those decisions. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and that's just, I've fished so many tournaments. I was, you know, lucky enough to fish a bunch in college and I've, spend a lot of time on the water outside of tournaments, but tournaments definitely 
uh, the more tournaments you fish, the more comfortable you'll be making a decision like that. It didn't even freak me out making that choice. And again, the, the conditions kind of made it an easy decision. Had it been a little better up there in Lake Marion that first day, I maybe would have had to, you know, think harder about it. But yeah, I didn't, I wasn't thinking, is this the wrong decision? All I knew is that staying there was definitely not the right decision. You know, so I had to change something and being able to recognize that, I guess, is an important thing. A hundred percent. It felt very obvious to me. Maybe it wouldn't be as obvious to some, but I felt, I felt, you know, when I got off the water and talked to all the other people that had fished in there, I felt very lucky to have, you know, it felt like I escaped slash survived to that day because of how bad the fishing actually got. So now going into day two, you know where you're at. Did you and your brother uh, make the switch? He, no, um, he had fished. So he started in a place called Jack's Creek the first day of the tournament. Okay. And we had fished there in practice, but it's one of the most popular places on Santee. And we knew there'd be a ton of kayakers there, a ton of bass boats there. But, um, his, you know, his other fish that he wanted to fish for, he knew that he wouldn't really be able to fish for them, um, in the wind. So that's why he, you know, we both had a, our first day decision was, all right, how are we going to combat this wind and less than ideal fishing conditions? And his choice was to stay in Jack's Creek and he only caught four fish. He lost one and it was a nice fish. If he would have caught that fish, he would have been up there in the top 10 with me, I think but uh or at least further into he did get the last check but you know he had a first a tough first day and so i think in the afternoon on the first day he changed and left from jack's creek and went up to what they call the swamp in lake marion and that's if you look at a certain point the lake just kind of turns into flooded cypress and it's just miles of it and he just you know scrapped his plans after jack's creek was not going well and he went up there i think he only actually caught two fish in jack's creek on that first day and then he left because it was so bad drove all the way up to this swamp because his buddy from practice had said hey you know i'm not catching nice ones up here but there's a lot of 15 inch fish and ewing has two fish he's like all right i gotta go catch fish so he went up there and then on the second day he just went back and only fished in that swamp. So he also made a change knowing that where he started was not going to fly trying to do it two days in a row at all. And so he spent his whole time on that North end of Marion. So gotcha. we, definitely both, we both recognized, Hey, this falling water is not good. We got to make big adjustments, be in different areas where these fish are going to uh, not be as affected, or we're going to be able to fish for the effective fish, affected fish from the dropping water, be able to target them better. And his, his solution was, this swamp i mean there's cypress trees everywhere he said you'd enter the trees the wind was not a factor he said it was dead calm in there everybody said that because it's so vast it's a forest up there and you can go he was more than a mile into just paddling through trees weaving in and out but there's there's channels there's creek channels that flow through there's current lots of current flowing up there and so these fish when the water drops, they're going to leave all these flooded still areas and they're going to probably pull right into those channels where the current's flowing very predictable. And that's exactly what they did. You know, that was his theory. We talked about it before. He's like, Hey man, you know, I want to go up there. The water's dropping. We're like, yeah, they got to go out to those channels. That's where they have to go to. They don't have a choice. They're, they're up in the stable water or what has been now it's dropping. They're going to get, you know, right out there in that current. And so that was his solution to, to the falling water. And your solution was to change lake. So, I mean, I, yep. I, mean, I guess real quick, just so you make the adjustment, you go to the other lake to launch. I'm assuming a lot more people also went with you with the conditions that you were dealing with with day one. Well, no. Um, wow. I don't know where everybody else went. I think it was honestly, it was so bad. A lot of people, I don't think even fished on day two. Like that's oh. how tough it was for a lot of people. Cause in the Creek that I fished on Marion, there was one guy that caught four fish other than me in that creek out of 13 fishermen the next best guy had four fish wow and then i think after that it was like two one or zero was what oh, everybody else had dude. It was, yeah it was bad <laughs> like when i say it was bad it was bad i think i caught eight and um but anyway so it was that's and a lot of people had days like that after having a good practice um for many and then it just got so terrible so i think a lot of people were pretty discouraged and it was cold on that second morning. So I think a lot of people uh, didn't fish because unfortunately in the Hobie BOS, like 
if you have a bomb first day, like you catch one fish, you know, there's no points. Like the points for the way they do their points, you're not going to, they only score your best three tournaments of the year. So, mm. you know, there's less of an incentive for people to go aside from pride to go and fish on that second day. And if you, if you've had a horrible day and it's not looking much better, I understand why, why guys didn't go on the second day. But anyway, yeah, I think I only saw two kayak fishermen in the Creek that I started on. And it is, it is a very obvious big place where I went, but uh aside from the fish that were actually on the bed it was very hard to catch fish in that area lake moultrie is very clear i saw some places on moultrie in practice where you could see the bottom in eight feet which is not what you would expect for when you think santee cooper you don't think of water that clear but there were i think the average visibility on that lake was five or six feet visibility i don't know if that's just this time of year it's like that but it was clean which i felt good about but i it- was not more Do vegetation? I, is there more vegetation on that part of the lake to filter so it out? I think, I think what happens is once it gets to that lake, the water has just had so much time to settle from the top end of Marion. And also there is, I know the lower end of Marion has a lot of vegetation, a lot of mats. I'm sure there's grass uh, and there is some grass uh, and there's a lot of lily pads and stuff in where I was. But I think it probably just has so much time to settle once it comes to, because it has to, you know, it all backs up in the bottom end of Marion and then it has to sit there before it flows through that canal. So I think it has time to settle. And then once it gets into Moultrie, it's, you know, it's a completely different lake, but it was surprising how, cause I wasn't far from that canal where I was fishing. I was on the North side of Moultrie and it was very clean water, which I felt good about for the spawn. Cause I can find these bed fish, you know, if it's a deeper bed, I can still see it. Whereas, up in Marion, if the fish was in a foot and a half of water, it better be sunny and you better be standing up to see him. So, so then what was your strategy going into that? Were you using the same bait, different tactics, different, different cover situation? I was using the same bait, but I changed my color because I was using, um, blue fleck was the color I was using, uh, in Marion. And I'm sure if you fish the Potomac, if you go up towards DC, that little baby brush hog in a, like a June bug or a blue fleck is a very good bait. Oh, but yeah. then if the water's cleaner here, I was, you know, I changed to green pumpkin. So, but it was still the same bait. That's what I'd caught them on in practice. Cause it was cool. I felt like if I'm just fishing, like I flipped to a dock, that's a great bait to get bit on. If I see a light spot that might be a bed, I can fish for him. If I'm visibly fishing for a bed fish, I caught some fish in practice using that. So it was a bait that, you know, I, I just, I have a lot of faith in that little guy. He catches a lot of fish. I've caught a lot of fish in different places and tons of people catch fish on that bait. It's a, it's a great bait all the time it's good on a carolina rig texas rig you know they just eat it did you have a single moving bait tied on for this event or you just have one rod i had i had a jerk bait um because i told you i had that area where i thought maybe pre-spawn and post-spawn fish should be going back and forth because i did have the live scope still on my kayak um and i wanted to try it because i realized on day two i probably only need to catch like 70 inches to cash a check and i think i may have even not even needed that much so i was like all right well first thing in the morning because i went down there to that lake to sight fish i'm like well that's not going to start happening at least till like 10 30 11 o'clock the sun is not at the right angle for me to be able to see those fish and since it was cold those fish aren't going to lock down onto their beds and be catchable they'll be around but they're not you're not going to want to fish for them it's going to be a waste of time before that so i was like i got this morning this time this chunk of time in the morning where i don't know what i'm going to do but a jerk bait and live scope. I'd caught a small one in practice doing that in that area, just trying to figure out it was a, so it's a, it's a Creek, but it's more like a canal that I think that's what the creeks down there are. They, they, they seem more like canals. It, felt, it almost felt like it was dredged out, but anyway, a lot like Florida. Yep. Very similar to a, a Florida Creek. Um, and so these fish would come feed into this Creek off the main lake. And then there's tons of little coves, backwaters, sloughs, all kinds of stuff feeding off of this thing. But the fish I was fishing for in the morning were in the ditch itself. And I found a spot that was kind of a harder bottom among the softer bottom and vegetation, which is, that's pretty much what you fish. I mean, on the Potomac, that's what you do. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I drug that Texas rig around some, because that's how I'd caught them in practice. But I also threw that jerk bait. And I caught like four fish on live scope on a jerk bait that morning. And they were like 11 inches long. And I was like, all right, (laughs) 
not going to do this anymore. But, you know, I, I kept it honest because, uh, you know, I had that free time to try to just catch some bonus fish. And that's that's all I was trying to do was just try something, you know, while I was kind of in idle mode. And uh, but I did catch two 12 inchers right off the bat, relatively right off the bat um, fish in that area. That was where I was planning on starting my day. And I was like, oh, crap, these are very small. I didn't, I didn't even know they made 12-inch fish in that lake. Like, I'm on Santee Cooper, and I go out, and I catch, like, six fish. And four of them are short, and two of them are, like, swipe the tail to get him to touch 12. Uh, and I ended up, I ended up uh, one of those fish stayed in my bag. So it was a good good oh, thing wow. that I did, I did fish for those fish. It was because I got kind of aggressive and bold and tried to only go catch big fish. And I almost got all big fish. But, yeah, so I did that. And I was fishing. So, yeah, I told you I fished that one hard spot. And then there was another point right across from it, a very small point, like a two cast point, you know, maybe a 10 by 10 area. But I could see this point that stuck out. I used live scope to see it because you can look at the contours of shallow water with it. You know what I mean? By panning it back and forth. Mm-hmm. And so I knew where the end of this point was. I didn't even have it turned on, but I just remembered where the end of it was. And I threw that baby brush hog out on it, drug it across it, caught a 19 incher. Wow. And at that point, I then have to decide like, all right, are there enough fish here that I need to just do this? And I can have a great day right here if I just slow down. Uh, And I I tried it some, but it just didn't feel right. I'd spent so much time already prior to catching that fish that I was like, I'm really glad I caught this fish. But I don't think, you know, I I don't think this is a a bite that's telling me anything. Kind of a a misleading bite almost, but they all count when it's on tournament Mm -hmm. day. So then I go back to check on some spawning fish that I had actually paddled past on my way out. And I go to this place where I'd seen a couple beds in practice and there were fish kind of cruising around and being weird. And they were still doing that. There was one that was on a bed and I pitched in there and he just left, which is never good. Like he completely Mm -hmm. got the hell out of Dodge, which they'll do that, you know, when they're not locked. Um, And there were several big ones cruising around on this flat that I could see at this point. I have a, that, yak attack pole thing shoved down in the ground and i'm i'm locked in that's the kayak equivalent when you don't have a kayak power pole that's the equivalent of power pulling down and i'm just standing there observing these fish and i'm like man if these fish were locked down i could top five off this right here top three probably um and i caught one on a wacky rig when he was just cruising i threw out in front of him most of them literally when they would see that wacky rig they would bolt the other direction like a 20 inch fish sees this little wacky rig shimmying down in front of him and he turns around and bolts 20 yards the other way which is horrible right I was yeah. like, this is not good this is not what i wanted to see but one of them was one of those like skinny fish probably has soft plastic in his belly or something but in a kayak tournament it doesn't matter so i, I sight fished one and i caught him and he was 19 i think 19 even and i was pumped to get that one right so now i've got two 12 inches two 19 inches people on the leaderboard are probably like what is he doing why why is it like that <laughs> um, and then i had i had a couple other beds in this creek marked and i had one bed that was a deeper bed that i was literally just pedaling in practice and i looked over and I saw a bed and I saw a fish just dart off of it. It wasn't a huge one, but it was a, a fish and I had marked it in practice. So I go back to that area and I'm kind of looking around. I can see a light patch, flick that wacky rig out there. I swear that fish must have swam straight up when that wacky rig hit the water. Cause I saw his, I saw a white flash when he sucked it. Dude. In. He was, he was ready. That was one of those easy bed fish caught that one. I think it was 15, 16 inches somewhere in there. You know, awesome. Now I've got a limit. Mm-hmm. I knew I was probably getting paid at that point. Uh, and I would have definitely been paid at that point, but I was like, all right, I gotta, you know, keep upgrading. And in my mind, having just caught those two fish and I'd seen so many fish shallow actually fishing for them in the pre-spawn post-spawn area. It didn't go that well. I was like, I'm just going to commit to sight fishing. It's feast or famine, going to give it a go. And I couldn't find any locked really moving around, moving around, checked for some fish that I had marked in practice. A lot of them were gone. You know, I'm sure they'd been caught the day before in bass boat tournaments and taken away. There's a good chance that happened. They probably quit spawning, you know, got done, whatever, whatever the reason was, there were a lot of them gone, but in the same way you have fish gone, you're going to have new ones too. Cause it's this time of year, fish are just cycling through. And I found a nice one on a pretty deep bed, very close to the area. I caught the one on the wacky rig, but, she was very skittish, but it was a lot bigger fish. I knew it was at least 18 inches plus. It looked like probably a four pound fish to me. Okay. And I was like, all right, well, I'm going to spend some time on this one. 
and it took me so long to catch that fish. I finally did. It was kind of amazing that I did, but when you're sight fishing in the spring, you can, you can make a fish lock down. That's not locked down at first. If you annoy it enough and the way you, I don't know if you sight fish much, but the way you can tell if a fish is going to bite, it's basically when, when you throw in a fish's bed, it'll leave. And it usually kind of does a circle before it comes back. And that first circle might be a 20 yard circle and it may take it a minute to come back. And sometimes that means, Hey, I'm, this fish isn't worth my time. That's going to take too long. And I just kept fishing for her. Like at first I would throw a wacky rig in there. She'd leave. She'd be gone for 45 seconds, a minute and a half. I'm like, where'd this fish go? I don't know. And all of a sudden she cruises back in. I'd shake it a little bit and she'd still, you know, she'd slide back off and I think it start shaking. But finally she'd sit there with that, you know, wasn't as freaked out by it. And I started pitching a drop shot in there, a white drop shot. Mm, I could okay. see that my bait's definitely in the bed, shake it around. And she would, then it got to the point where she wasn't mad at the drop shot, but she would sit in the bed while it was there. I couldn't get her to do anything with that. So then I pick up a white craw, the standard, what everybody bed fishes with. And I start pitching that at her and she would leave the bed, you know, wouldn't come back for a minute. And she comes back. Also the wind's blowing. So whenever the gusts would come through, I couldn't see her. I could just uh, kind of see the bed. And, you know, so then I'm kind of, it's kind of like hitting the reset button each time because part of bed fishing and annoying one is you have to be repetitive. Like if there's too long in between when you're making a cast to annoy this fish, it's almost like they revert to however they were before. And so I'm pitching this white craw and I'm like, you know, she's not really doing anything right, but she is kind of getting closer staying closer to the bed when she's leaving she's not getting as far away which is a good sign and finally i mean i've been there at this point i'm like i didn't know if i had anything else to go to and it was still it was probably only like i don't know 11 12 o'clock but how much time at this point you think has passed like 40 minutes and Damn, okay um but it was a big fish you know i'm like i know that that fish alone regardless of what else i might find that fish is worth a lot of money that fish right there yeah regardless of what else happens and at this point i knew that you know because of that guy the day before he started crushing them uh that nathan guy who won uh, he started crushing them right off the bat the next day so i was like the win is out of the question i'm trying to make money um and so i was like if i can get this fish to bite so she and then eventually she does like a quick donut you know how when they when they do that quick spin yeah. on the bait and i was like oh crap she might bite and then i'm really freaked out because i'm like when she bites it i better get a good hook in her because you know you can set the hook and they come off that you know that's fishing and especially bed fishing when they're being funky they don't eat it great and so there's a there's a way you i call it playing catch with them you've probably heard people talk about it but you gotta when the fish is sitting there you want to kind of hop that bait in the bed and kind of like hop it and get them, get it to hit them in the head when you hop it. And then all of a sudden you'll see them like the, the pop their mouth real quick, flare their gills. Mm -hmm. and I saw her do that. I saw her pop it when I, I hopped it in front of her and I was like, Oh crap, you know, this fish is probably actually going to bite. And now she's just locked. She's just sitting. And I keep pitching, keep pitching. And I, I hop it and all of a sudden I hop it and I kind of see a flash and I pick up and it's just, she didn't swim off with it. She just caught it and just sits set the hook on her, caught her. It was another 19 inch fish. And it took me an hour, almost an hour to catch that fish. And I was like, man, I'm so glad that fish bit. I'm glad it, you know, stayed hooked, but that's, you know, sometimes you gotta, that's, that's sight fish. And it's not always going to be easy, but a big fish is a big fish. And I, you know, I knew that that was probably my best, best bet at doing well was to just commit to that fish. Well, and having the gut instinct to know like when to do it, like I think that's the hardest thing with bed fishing is especially if they get bigger, like the Florida size ones, yep. you're like, well, shit, like, is it worth spending three hours on this one? But yep. when you talk about um, hopping it like towards their head, how much of it is fish positioning compared to you? So if it's facing towards you, is that the proper angle to try to drop it on their head versus if it's parallel or, or facing away? Is there a specific angle you're looking for to be able to I, achieve that? I like the fish to be broadside. It just so happened to work out in a kayak. It's a lot harder to, well, granted, I don't have power poles on my boat either, but, um, in a kayak, you know, the positioning is kind of difficult, especially in the wind. And so it just happened to work out that she was broadside to me, but when they're broadside, you can see clearly, cause what you don't want to do is hit them anywhere in the back half of their body. That's bad. If you hit them back there, it freaks them out. They don't like it. The front half is better strictly from where that gill starts forward is great like if you can just hit them on the nose every time but anywhere in the head if you hit them in the head that and again like i'm i'm not crazy about bed fishing but it's a tournament and there's money on the line yeah especially i'm putting them right back uh but you know like it's just funny me sitting here like hey you gotta hit him in the head like it's bed fishing i don't know gray area but that's not what we're worried about right now yeah
Um, but yeah, you got to hit them in the head. And when they're broadside, that gives you the best opportunity to see where that fish's head is and watch your bait come into the right spot so that you don't hit him in the wrong spot, hit him or her in the wrong spot and scare it. And, uh, facing towards you seems to be the worst. If the fish is facing towards you because they see you, they're looking at you move around. And I don't think they like that as much. Um, and also you can usually tell when a fish, when a fish does its little donut and then comes back, does a circle and comes back. Um, they usually have a certain part where they sit. That's the, they'll get mad when they're sitting in that way. So this fish, it was when she was broadside, her head was facing to the left, tail to the right. That was when she would want to bite. Sometimes she'd come back in the bed and she'd be facing the wrong way or she'd be a little bit off to the side. And I knew it wasn't even worth me trying to mess with her. I just needed to wait until she got to that one position. And the only way for you to figure that out is just by watching the body language of the fish. And that just, it just takes a long time. I've just spent a lot of time fishing. I'm able to recognize that. Well, why did you decide to actually visually see it versus like, I don't know, backing off and making a couple of casts first to see if you, if I think, I, I think I probably did that. I think okay. I probably tried that, but usually, um, well, and also in a tournament, I mean, granted, I didn't know the fish were going to take an hour, but a wacky <laughs> rig is a lot less surefire than a Texas rig on heavy line that, you know, you hit them hard with. Cause like, if, if you know, you're going to get the fish to bite, I would rather hook it on something that I feel yeah. like I have great odds with. And so that's kind of a, a hard thing to, I was actually, that's something I don't even have a great grip on yet, but I can remember knowing where a bed fish was. And I'm like, man, do I throw the wacky rig to it right now from a long ways off? And if it bites, hope that I land it, or do I get up and actually sight fish for this thing and, you know, go through the motions of upsetting this fish so that when I do hook it, I have a better chance of putting it in the boat. Uh, cause once you mess it up, you know, if you have one come off, sometimes they'll bite again, but a lot of times they don't. That's just confidence. I feel like, like how much yeah. do, you, do you have confidence yeah. in a fairy one? Do you have confidence oh, in yeah. four oh, or yeah. six? Oh, five I've, pound got, test? I've got, well, no, I don't, I don't fish line that light. Usually I'll, if I'm fishing six, I will have a very good reason to explain to you why I think I need to use <laughs> six. Uh, I normally don't fish anything lighter than eight, eight, 10 and 12 is what I, I was fishing 12 pound at this, but I'm just meaning the hook more so than anything. Mm, okay. I am so pretty confident about the, the setup. I use the Berkeley fusion wide gap. I know a lot of guys have gone to that Nico style hook. I don't like that for wacky rig fishing. Um, why? I feel like I get hung up with it. You know how everybody uses that VMC with the weed guard, the mono weed guard. Nico yeah. uh, you can, you get that thing hung everywhere. Like if you throw it in some brush, it gets hung up and fishing around those cypress trees, you'd spend more time getting that thing unhung than you would actually fishing. So I really like that, that Berkeley fusion wide gap with the mono weed guard. That thing is super weedless. And I think that the way that I set the hook is probably why I have better results with those wide gap hooks. Cause I don't really lose them. I mean, I say that I'll probably lose a giant in the next tournament on a wacky rig, but I hit the fish so hard when I fish with a wacky rig, like you, you got to hit them hard. It's not a drop shot. It's not, you know, it's not a Ned rig. Like some, everybody likes to, with a spinning rod, they like to lean into them and start reeling. Like with a nose hook drop shot. Yes. That's what you do with a swim bait open hook on a little jig head like a 2.8 3.3 kitech that's what you do with a wacky rig you hit them hard like that's the way you get that hook in the fish i don't know if it's because you have and maybe since i don't fish with o-rings i don't like o-rings because it i don't know i just that freaks me out i don't like my hook sitting the wrong direction on the worm i want to have that hook right through the worm and so maybe it's because that hook has to come through that worm that's why you have to set the hook so hard or maybe it's just the type of hook and the way that that hook sits in the fish the best is when you hit them hard but i crack them on a wacky rig and i have very good results with putting those fish in the boat i didn't lose any uh in the tournament i guess i caught i caught two or three on it no i caught i caught one the first day too on uh marion i had a, a sight fish that i couldn't figure out where his bed was but he was either guarding fry or guarding bed and it was in that tea colored water i just knew he was there and i left and came back like two hours later and skipped my wacky rig in there and caught him from a long ways off and that one you know i was obviously freaked out but all all the fish i caught on the wacky rig were right where yeah. that hook was supposed to be yeah i just wonder if it's just because of the angle like when you're fishing a drop shot that hook is always pointed up so mm -hmm. it doesn't take a lot of pressure to stick them compared yeah, to 
depending on how they inhale that wacky rig. Um, and you have so much plastic to deal with as well. Like, mm -hmm. and that's the one thing that makes me nervous about going with light line with stuff like that is, is the fact that I feel like if I'm throwing a, um, a, a Kai tech or something like that, they may or may not get the whole bait. So they don't get their teeth on the line mm -hmm. or same thing with a drop shot, generally speaking. But yeah, with that wacky worm, if they suck that thing in and you have six pound tests on, on mm -hmm. a six pounder, I mean, ugh. yeah. Yeah. It's, and when I, if I'm fishing eight on a wacky rig, like if it's that clear, I feel like I need to use eight. I probably will not be using that same hook. I'd probably use something without a weed guard on it and maybe even a lighter gauge hook of some sort, uh, because I don't think I can set the hook hard enough for it to, because if you don't set the hook hard enough on that hook that I'm talking about first jump, he's coming off. But if you set the hook hard, you got him. And there's, you know, there's several hooks that are like that. I'm sure, you know, but there's some hooks that are way more forgiving with a light hook set, just kind of reeling into them. Cause like with the, the wacky hook I'm talking about, if you like say one has it and you're not paying attention and you start to reel your cast and you realize he's there and then you just kind of lean and start reeling, like you're probably, he's probably going to jump off. You got to, you know, you got to make sure you hit him hard with it, but I have great results when I do what I'm supposed to do, setting the hook on that. But yeah, Good. 10, 10 and 12 pound line. There's what I, for my leader is what I feel like I need in order to do that. Good stuff, dude. Good stuff. And yeah, I mean, congratulations on cashing that really, really nice check there yeah. in that tournament. So well, I guess, uh, where can people follow you and what do you have coming up next? So right now I'm trying to get my YouTube going. I have Instagram. That's where most of my uh, following is, but I really want to, I'm going to take YouTube pretty seriously this year. I'm going at least one video per week. I Good may news. increase that frequency, but YouTube is where people should look for me. Um, just my name, Nolan Miner, is is my YouTube channel. And uh, my next tournament, I think it's like, I don't know. It's the next Hobie BOS. It's on Ufala. It's uh, April, I think, I want to say maybe like 24 or 25 is when it starts. But it's, oh, shit, it's, it's coming up then. There. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's pretty soon. Uh, and it, the fishing should be really good. But in the south, when the fishing's good in the spring, there's a lot of fishermen too, especially a place like Lake Ufala. That's a fishing community. So it'll be interesting, I'm sure. But the fishing should, you know, be good if you can find a way to outsmart their fishermen. But that's tournament fishing. Yeah, no, that's tournament fishing. And yeah, keep up the YouTube. You have some fantastic content. Uh, just, just watching all your recap videos. I absolutely love it. Um, and I like some of those places you were smallmouth fishing on Instagram too. Those were, that, that rafting looked awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I went on the New River yesterday with my buddy. Hopefully I'll uh, do some of that later this summer when we can catch a little more numbers. Good deal. Well, guys, make sure you give him a follow. Uh, watch his kayak tournament rise to fame. And uh, we'll see him next time, hopefully in the future. Thanks, bud, so much for uh, for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me on. And we're going to end that right there. Guys, that was uh, Nolan Miner. You know, uh, uh, super duper awesome to actually have him on again, really talking about that kayak fishing, uh, his YouTube growth and, and claim to fame there. It, it, it's really freaking cool to be able to have access to some of these really cool people and just to learn stuff. Uh, again, please like and subscribe to the YouTube channel. It helps with the algorithm, helps us grow the channel so we can have more cool guests on and bring more and great content. If you would like to be on the show, if you would like to really highlight your YouTube channel, your TikTok, your, your bait company, or your tournament fishing, and you want to push your brand, please reach out to me. You can reach out to me on Instagram or Facebook at fishing the DMV, or you can email me at aaronsbasson at gmail.com. Otherwise I'll see you guys next time on fishing the DMV. Bye guys. You're listening to fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Aaron's and Jared mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's bait and tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.